it that I'd like to request Professor Ramakrishnan, who is here in Investigation Studies Center in Beijing, uh, to speak to the to uh, appreciate the fact that uh, the Buster Solidar can uh, uh, come out with the report and uh, they have exposed uh, innumerable atrocities that are going on uh, in different parts of the country, particularly is good uh, in Odessa and so on. What is important is, is that much of this is happening because the state wanted the inhabitants of the, of the place out for corporations to function. And that neoliberal politics and economy, that sense, why did we elect or the nation elect a, a strong leader is to provide that neoliberal content to Indian politics. You know a General Pinochet was needed to do that in Chile, Reagan was needed in the United States, the Margaret Thatcher was needed for neoliberalism to, to go to its maximum extent. And you know that this government came to power with the slogan that you know they stand for minimum government, maximum governance. And what is not spoken about, and you know that neoliberal policies are nothing new with this government. But what happens is that that strong leadership is coming up, or it has been materialized or it there, uh, which in a way goes along with the minimum government thesis of Hayek and Friedman and others of neoliberal. And most often we think that minimum government with respect to market, state intervention will be less. What you see in Central India, in uh, the regions that we record powers, for example, or what is the Maoist affected areas and so on. What they represent is the function of a maximum government, loosely. For what? For the minimum government functions with respect to market. And therefore, what you see is that when for free market operation to happen, you need a strong government, which in a big manner is available now uh, to this kind of, of uh, political leadership. And therefore, what I'm concerned more about is the politics of, of neoliberalism and this, this young child. Uh, which is a strong government, a strong leader, a strong party, and so on and so forth. And a strong India, and we are suffering from that strong. And I've spoken about that earlier as well. You know, when Professor Yuvar Anantamurti came here for the last time in his life to Delhi, I was there in the Delhi press club to listen to him. What he was saying was that he came at that point in time when the election result was always almost sure that that this entity would come to power. Uh, but he said, still, I had to speak about it. He said that what I am afraid of is a strong India. Because that's the end of its diversity, that's the end of its human rights. That's the end of its languages and cultures and different ways of life for people in different regions. And what we should do, according to him, 
is not to allow the strong in, the, in that sense to function with a strong leader. That's a democratic sensibility. That's a sensibility of a writer who knew how a political nation functions, how militarism functions. And it is that kind of force that is unleashed over people, particularly over people who resist, who resist to separation of their resources, of the land, of which is just minerals and metals and other things for, for the government. But that is the lifeblood of king. That is centuries and centuries of, of life within a particular place. It's an attachment, it's a rootedness that people have for their ways of life. And that's precisely what will not be allowed. And that is where you see the extreme form of atrocities which are getting that happen. And you know what Judith Butler and others were telling us that the markers of this kind of neoliberal sovereignty is on the bodies of the human being. That you see that through the bullet wounds, through the beating up of people, you can see those you know, sovereignty, that extreme form of nationalism being applied to human body. That you become numb, you cannot act anymore. So any kind of activism therefore is what is resisted by the state. Any form of resistance is what is being, you know, challenged and suppressed. And this is very, very important that, uh, you know, this notion of nation-state sovereignty over people's own lives and people's own imagination of their own determination of their lives, which is extremely significant. And that is people determining their own lives is what is resisted by the state. And therefore, for us in an academic community like this, is to think about the implications of all this for the very political imagination that we have. And at this juncture, it's extremely significant what's happening around us, what many of you are facing. And the university as a concept itself is facing. Um, there, the, the notion of solidarity, therefore, is not simply about um, a level of connection, in, you know, at, at that level of ideas, but a level of connection of experiences of undergoing this kind of, of suppressing the determination of the life by the themselves. This is extremely significant. I'm here just to, to express my my appreciation of, of the work that is being done by the fact finding team. And I think this has to be told to many people across, as many people as we can across the country, so that at least some semblance of democratic life some semblance of holding on to the sources of, of the country to the detriment of the people here can be undertaken, not to plunder that can be undertaken, and not the kind of nation state that can deny its people their own authority to, to do themselves as any imagination of democracy assumes that. And therefore, I think that this work has to, has to continue. And that is the story that we have taken the initiative.